So let me then um, introduce our panel. We have a very distinguished panel. Um, to my left, we have Dr. Tin Luen Tuang, Executive Director of Recoff TC, the Center for People and Forests. Dr. Tin is the Executive of Recoff TC. He has over 25 years of professional experience in forest management, forest research, and community forestry. He was formerly with an advisor with the Nature Conservancy, has led the Responsible Asia Forestry and Trade Program, and also worked with IUCN regional offices in Bangkok. And the next speaker we have is Ms. Joan Carling. Uh, Joan is Secretary General of the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact. Joan is an Indigenous activist from Cordillera, the Philippines. She has worked on Indigenous issues both at all levels, from the grassroots to the international level. And her field of expertise includes human rights, sustainable development, environment, and climate change. And she has also been working a lot on the principles and application of the FPIC, Free Prior and Informed Consent, and is actively engaged with international bodies, processes such as the UNFCCC, RED, and Red Plus, and also with other mechanisms related to management of natural resources. <laughs> the third speaker we have is uh, Ms. Pamaningse Hadi Nagoro. Uh, Ibu Palma is the Vice President and Corporate Secretary of Danone Aqua. She started her career with PT Unilever Indonesia and has also worked with the Monsanto companies in Indonesia, as well as with PT Turta Investama. So currently with uh, PT Aqua Golden Mississippi, she is on the board of directors, um, and currently the managing director also of Ibig Sindrian Bahad in Brunei. And the last speaker we have, and not the least, is Dr. Yatna Supriyatna. Dr. Yatna is the chairman of the Research Center on Climate Change of Universitas Indonesia. He is also chairman of the Oversight Committee of the Tropical Forest Conservation Act Trust Fund, the TFCA, which is part of a debt for nature swap scheme between the US and Indonesian governments. Pak Yana is also a member of the Indonesia Academy of Science and formerly the Indonesia Vice President for Conservation International. Thank you, Grace. Um, thank you very much for giving this opportunity to come and share the, uh, some of the uh, perspective that um, uh, especially the Regional Community Forestry Training Center that uh, the organization I'm working for. Uh, when I got an invitation from Grace to uh, be part of this panel, um, I, I consider quite a lot you know, to, to, to decide. And also I discussed with my team and in Recop to see whether we should go or we should not go. The reason is um, we are very careful um, about the spending and traveling, um, especially that we don't want to uh, create uh, many, many carbon footprint, you know, um, if it is not necessary. But the time is um, um, also, I I'm seriously hope that the, the, the some of the perception and the, some of the point we made here is uh, taken by the, uh, seriously taken by the, uh, um, the key players, especially the donor communities and decision maker to uh, make this point uh, seriously in their future policy and uh, decision-making process. You know, the, the reason is um, the, the, I work for the uh, Regional Community Forestry Training Center. This training center has been um, um, 27 years already, um, started as the uh, very intergovernmental uh, organization to promote the uh, uh, community forestry in the region especially in the Asian Pacific region, we are very much focused to enhance the capacity of the local people to actively participate in the forest management and to address the, a number of the issues facing in their daily lives. RECOV has a, a very clear three guiding principles. So all these guiding principles are very directly linked to the, all the, your questions, Grace. So I think um, this is the right time for us to, to enhance you know, our uh, guiding principle is still the right thing. The first guiding principle is um, uh, we're trying to ensure the um, securing the um, uh, tenure 
and a stronger tenure for the uh, local people um, who are living around and also the um, very much uh, taking the uh, this uh, resources from the forest area. Of course, the second guiding principle is uh, we trying to whatever activity we trying to do uh, in our organization and with the partner, we want to make sure that we trying to improve the governance. Governance is one of the key principles we all need to focus, to have a transparency, accountability, and also the participatory monitoring evaluation system. Of course, the third guiding principle is talking about the fair benefit. We are sometimes quite reluctant to use the equitable, because at the end of the real life, you know, when you're trying to translate this word to the communities and the stakeholder in the ground, it is a bit challenging concept. They thought that equitable is equal. I don't think it is impossible to get a benefit equally for everybody. The world we are living in is not equal. Now we are not getting this equal status. So sometimes we got to be very careful when we introduce this kind of concept to the uh, grassroots, to the local people. We want to make sure this concept is adaptable to their circumstances. So we try and sometimes use a fair benefit. You know, the fairness is a little bit more easily acceptable terminology for the, um, um, the, the target audience that we are working for. Recently, last year, RECOF organized the, um, uh, what called the forum, regional uh, forum for people and forest. Clearly, we invited the, um, a number of the stakeholders coming from the region. We have uh, more than 100 stakeholders participants. They have a very common vision saying that they want to develop four areas to move this agenda forward. The first thing is securing the forest tenure. Community forest is still very priority for everybody. The second thing is, of course, the um, making sure whatever policy we developed, these policy need to be turned into the practical action. So this is the one of the area, even you have a very good policy, policy are still on the paper, not really implementing, not really reaching to the target audience. This is the challenge we're still having. The third area all the participants agree to further address is to make sure that um, the, you know, the, the community forestry development is still a very slow process and it's still sp uh, spreading everywhere. We want to make sure this development have a more consolidated approach, looking into within the landscape framework so that um, we can have a better um, impact and outcome of the uh, development in community forestry. The fourth one is, of course, talking about this um, um, making sure forestry agenda to be part of the uh, global development agenda. We should not be out of this global development agenda. Whenever we develop the uh, Millennium Development Goal or Sustainable Development Goal beyond the 2015, this forestry sector, especially for the community forestry must, sector, must be very important in spite of those uh, development agenda. Of course, the fourth part we are talking is um, you know, making this um, the real case for the local people. When we try to promote the community products, reaching to the market level. We want to look at beyond the subsistence level. So we want to make sure their products are reaching to the commercial scale and also the reaching to the more competitive market things. So these are the challenges we, we, um, um, we discuss and also the other participants agree to further address in the future. So very much linking to this your um, framework of your question and I would like to leave um, other, other speakers also to give a um, chance talking to, to this event as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tint. Um, I think you raised quite a lot of important questions and perhaps one that is really interesting is also the perspective of what is equity and what is fairness. And I'm, I think we'll listen to the other speakers and then come back to some of these questions. Please, John. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me first begin by stating that uh, when we're talking of, of Asia, it actually have two-thirds of the world's indigenous peoples, which is more than 200 million. And if we're talking of ASEAN, there's around 80 to 100 million, and at least 60 million of these are living in the forest or are dependent in the forest. And uh, indigenous peoples living in the forest or elsewhere have the major contribution given their very low carbon lifestyle and they practice sustainable use of resources, particularly forest resources. And, and this is one of their biggest contribution in terms of uh, addressing climate change. 
now uh, because of our lifestyle and because of our uh, uh, sustainable use of, of resources, we are able to maintain the kind of relationship that we have with nature and, and thereby when we talk of our rights, we are talking of our rights over our customary forest, our right to practice our traditional and sustainable livelihood uh, relating to forests, like for example, uh, hunting and gathering, uh, gathering of forest timber products, uh, practice of sustainable shifting cultivation that supports food security and biodiversity enhancement, as well as we also have our right to fair and equitable uh, benefits from our uh, conservation and management of, of the forest, as well as our contribution to the to carbon sequestration. Now, uh, if we look at ASEAN at, at the moment, uh, it, 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 it's very alarming that in spite of the rhetorics of ASEAN for green growth, uh, it's very clear that the infrastructure uh, or the investment plan and development plan of ASEAN is with still in the context of business as usual in terms of putting up infrastructures, putting up large dams, putting up all these highways uh, that cuts across uh, traditional forest, expansion of palm oil, expansion of commercial agriculture. And how can this be equitable? How can this be made equitable to community development or to green growth? And uh, so, so for us, for indigenous peoples, we have defined that in terms of our equitable entitlement, uh, first and foremost is that equitable development should be consistent with the recognition and respect and exercise of the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities, especially, as already stated, of land tenure and the use of our resources to meet our own needs. And the benefits that we get from, uh, from the co-benefits for conserving uh, forest should be an additionality to the basic social services that is entitled for everyone. So when I say additionality, it should be mainly to support sustainable livelihoods, including sustainable ag ag agroforestry that provides for food security, that provides for the needs of the communities, that, that, su that, that, that supports and provides uh, the needs of the poorest of the poor, the women and children. So when we talk of equitable, we are not just talking of like, like what my colleague said, it's not equal, it's really addressing the needs of the poorest of the poor and women and children and also the elderly. It's raising up their quality of life, raising up their well-being so that they are at par with others and closing the gap between the rich and the poor. It also means avoiding elite capture of, of the benefits that should go to the communities and not just few uh, individuals. Uh, equitable benefits from carbon and non-carbon contributions of indigenous peoples should also provide for appropriate facilities and infrastructures for community development according to the needs of, of the communities. For example, distribution of clean water, irrigation, uh, renewable energy, and agrofor enhancement of agroforestry production that is, that is sustainable, as well as providing economic empowerment uh, for, for women. So these are the challenges that we think should be addressed when we talk of green economy or uh, equitable development. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, so that is very interesting because you have raised also yet another point about equity, in which case you've raised that equity is really about having the rights to development and having rights to development across all parts of society, particularly for the, for the um, poor and for, the, for women and so on. So that is another perspective that we have heard from our second speaker. Um, let me invite our third speaker, Ibu Parma, to also give your perspective from the private sector. Thank you. Thank you. 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Very good afternoon to you all. Um, first, I think it's, it's freezing in here, so if you can do something, uh, can we adjust the temperature so that we can also save some energy <laughs> and save the carbon footprint? Um, okay, when we say what are the rights of communities and smallholders, and what roles can communities and smallholders can play in the sustainable management of forest and landscape? Uh, the question is whether the community and the smallholders have the capacity and the competency to play their role. Because actually they should have been the main actor in the sustainable management of forest and landscape. In this opportunity, I would like to share what we have been doing as a private sector and how we can play our role in sustainable management of forest and uh, landscape. Danon Aqua is managing its watershed to maintain the quality and quantity of water resource in a sustainable way. It means we are implementing programs and integrated water resource based on four pillars, which are the nature and environment, social, economic, education, as well as the organization, based on research and assessment. We are working together with the local NGOs, which has the expertise and the competencies within the areas to facilitate a social mapping, to understand the economic and social condition of the areas, as a foundation to develop programs and also community empowerment to build the capacity of the community. So again, in here, we have to empower the community so that they can play their role and be the main actor. So that the empowered community is encouraged to approach all the other stakeholders who have direct and indirect interest in preserving the watershed to establish multi-stakeholder forum. The forum is to align vision and perception of all the watershed users so that they are able to develop action plan to manage watershed. Public awareness on the importance of environment preservation, collective responsibility, and also active role from the related stakeholders, which are the government, the private sector, the civil society, uh, etc., etc., are the main key of a successful conservation program. This action is taken to ensure that the growth rate of the trees planted is high. Managing watershed is a long term commitment so that we in Danon Aqua will continue to develop programs that ensure quality of the outcome. I have some uh, example how we can maintain the growth rate of trees planted at 100%. We have a program in Panchawati village, Charingin Subdistrict in Bogor, where we work with the National Park of Mountain Gede Pangrango and the communities who live surrounding the area to conserve the area and at the same time also to earn for their living. We started the program in 2012. We facilitated Gamalina, the local NGO, to conduct the assessment, sustainable livelihood assessment, as the foundation to start the community development. The program focused more on how to maintain the growth rate and not just how many trees are planted. So the local NGO held several training um, basically, they uh, train the cadres so that the cadres in turn can also influence or educate a higher uh, community. And uh, they are responsible to nurturing 1,200 trees that have been planted in the mountain, uh, in the national park. So again, it's not about the quantity, but it's the quality and how the community is responsible to nurture the tree and to ensure that it will be there one year from now, three years from now, and uh, so on. To compensate their effort and replacing their dependency on the forest product, the farmers are facilitated to use 
the national parkland to plant crops such as cucumbers and tomatoes so that they could sell them as their income. Uh, I have some more uh, example, but I think the uh, time will not allow. But uh, basically what uh, the key message in here is that managing watershed is not one responsibility, it's a shared responsibility amongst every stakeholders, among all other stakeholders, and that the community should be the main actor and they have to be empowered so that they can in turn approach other stakeholders and that they um, can earn their living at the same time also preserve the nature. And the, um, the role of the government is also very important because they are the one who uh, define the policies and, regu and regulation which is supposed to support the integrated uh, water resource management or in general in preserving the uh, environment. Uh, last but not least, um, I would also like to mention in here that based on our experience, uh, what will work uh, best is to have a forum consisted of all the stakeholders and they sit together and based on the research and assessment, they define the program, work together starting from the planning, the implementation, the monitoring, and also the evaluation. So that's from uh, my side. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Parma, for giving us a, a case study of how the private sector can also work with communities in terms of conservation and development. Um, and then I invite Pat Yatna to give your short brief, perhaps more from the conservation and biodiversity <laughs> perspective. Thank you. Very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I used to talk about biodiversity in front of very uh, large biodiversity people. But this afternoon, I have to talk with all these people interested in the communities. Uh, maybe I, I will have a different opinion and I hope that I, I will provo provocate to everybody here uh, uh, how that really uh, this community in conservation and, and forest uh, conservation in Indonesia or in Southeast Asia. Let me start with how important is Southeast Asia. We have four uh, hotspot area, you know, previous speaker about the high biodiversity is Indonesia. We have like Indo-Burma in Thailand, Vietnam, and others. We have Sundaland, we have Wallacea, we have Philippines. So we are very rich. And plus, of course, we have community who are very uh, ethnic diverse in Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been of uh, 40 years teaching in, and doing research in biodiversity and from one area, uh, forest to the other forest. I can tell you that there is no success story on conserving the biodiversity in Indonesia, in the Southeast Asia. Everything, you know, if you look at that, the Tiger is declined, the elephant is declined, everything is declined. Why is it? This one that I thought after 40 years back and forth to the jungle, the community has not got benefit. The community has not been involved in the biodiversity, in conservation, in, the, uh, in, in, in forest management. I thought that, you know, as the biologists and been the, and I thought that we can guarding this uh, national park, we can do all these forests, but has not been any, any progress in Indonesia and in Southeast Asia. So what is the key? I have been joining with this, uh, uh, becoming the chairman of the oversight committee of the tropical forest conservation of trust fund in Sumatra. And we were working with community and I thought that, you know, the first thing that if we can have a lot of community 
who can work in, you know, uh, already work in the jungle and they see if there are any success story they can tell. And, you know, after, uh, no, it's already three or four years, there's so many success story, you know. And it, it's a funny thing is that there's one area where there is empty forest syndrome that is in the park. But in the area where in the garden forest, where community guard, there is orangutan, there is everybody. There is a lot of biodiversity there. So what does it mean? It seemed to me, right, that without communities, there is no sustainable forest management. There is no such in this Southeast Asia that the government can guard it. I can hear from this morning, even from the president, our deforestation is really high. So I believe that after 38 community they are working with, we have 60,000 hectares save the forest by communities. And they have a lot of customary forests, village forests, community forests, you name it. I think the, the key is that how do we make this community get benefit from the forest? Sometimes you think that community will not understand conservation. You think that community will not understand how do, do we use this, uh, the uh, ecosystem services. You think that the community, well, they don't understand the policy of this thing. But in fact, after years and years working with community, I just realized it as a biodiversity and biologist specialist on conservation in the jungle. It seemed that a keeper thing is that without community involvement in, com in the forest management, I don't believe they will be sustained in managing the forest. So a key thing, again, I, I really believe it. After years and years, especially when I was in Conservation International, we spent many, many dollars, I don't count it, but it was really back again to what the conservation is really related to communities. So I, I really believe it that community has to be part of the the three sector collaboration, I think the first, uh, the, the last speaker mentioned about the multi stakeholders. I do think that I really agree with the first and second speaker that equal, equitable development is very important. A health community has to be also part of that. Should be equal, not always the government has to be uh, the decision making on that policy. Because my understanding that I've been working in conservation many, many years, that once the decision maker by the district level, the governor said, well, this area has to be developed to be oil palm and many others. But then community can be becoming the victims of that. I think there should be, in the first place, there has to be equal on making this decision on the area. I think that's really my point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for all four, four speakers for um, giving your short presentations on your perspectives. Uh, before we open up to the question and answer to the audience, I'd, I'd like to ask perhaps a follow-up question to each of you. Um, perhaps I'll start with you, John. Um, as Pat Yatna was saying, communities have to be part of the solution uh, in terms of conservation and sustainable development. And my question to you is, as you mentioned about ASEAN and the new the economic integration and also a lot of these changing economic policies, how has the values of indigenous peoples uh, been impacted by these external economic and policy changes? And how has you know those values um, been kind of taken in, in extra, internalized, and how do they reflect in terms of their management of the resources? 
Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, that's quite an interesting question because un un unfortunately, in spite of all our efforts to reach out to the ASEAN, the more than 60 million indigenous peoples remain invisible in, in, the, in the roadmap or development plan of, of ASEAN as if we don't exist in terms of you know, their, their plans on, on forest or, or all these infrastructures or creation of, of, of large, large towns. But I believe that there is an increasing uh, acknowledgement of the roles and contributions of indigenous peoples to uh, sustainable resource management. Uh, for example, the enhancement of biodiversity because of our low carbon uh, lifestyle. In, in, in fact, if you look at the remaining forest in ASEAN, it's in the territories of indigenous peoples. Because our communities, as much as possible, prevented illegal loggers or, or commercial logging or expansion of, of palm, palm, palm oil. So uh, this kind of, of, of contribution is now being uh, recognized. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for co-management of resources within, the, within, within a human rights-based approach of, of the rights of indigenous peoples over, over customary forests, but at the same time contributing to, uh, to food security, which is one major, uh, major contribution also of our uh, resource management, as well as, the, like I said, the enhancement of, of biodiversity. So if we look at, for example, our effective participation in a multi-stakeholders uh, process, what I want to emphasize here when we talk of multi-stakeholders process is also to recognize that we have our roles and responsibilities. Uh, we should not forget that states are, are, are still largely the, the duty bearers. They, 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 have the, they have the power to make policies and enforce policies, but at the same time, they need to respect the rights of indigenous people. So these policies should be consistent with respecting the rights. Then we also ask, as, as the rights holders and the others, like private sector, are bound to respect rights and contribute for economic development. So in, 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 in that connection, I, I think there's, there's opportunities to move forward along, along this line. Okay, thank you. Um, and so that brings us also to you, Dr. Tint. You, you mentioned that um, forestry should be part of the global development agenda. And you mentioned that forestry should be, you know, learning the lessons from perhaps the MDG process and moving to the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, yesterday, President SBY said something about setting appropriate targets, indicators, criteria for sustainable forestry, and I wonder how you, how you might um, move forward, or what are your suggestions for moving forward in terms of appropriate criteria Thank or you. indicators? Thank you, Grace. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very trying to be very positive but at the same time, we need to be very realistic, especially when we give uh, some critical comments and points. Uh, when you look at the um, yesterday, I was also very inspired to I mean um, uh, and to listen to the speech from the uh, president talking about the sustainable forestry can be uh, uh, must be the uh, in the development agenda in coming and coming uh, futures um, coming decades. Looking at the um, uh, uh, millennium development goals over the last um, <clears throat> decade. They, are, um, they said in the report, most of the goals they achieved, especially in the um, uh, education and health sector. When it, they talk about the um, uh, achievement in the environmental sustainability is one of the millennium development goals. They have, uh, I think, about four criteria they me measure in that uh, goal. Um, of course, they mentioned, they mentioned that um, like access to the drinking water and uh, having the, uh, better sanitation, they are quite good criteria and indicator. They can measure this, um, some of the um, sustainable development goal has been achieved. But if you look at the um, uh, integrating the sustainable development, we still lost our forest at an alarming rate. I don't think this is a good indicator as well. This is not the, the right case. I mean, I mean, what I mean is uh, uh, we should do a little bit much better. And also they mentioned about this um, 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 increasing the uh, uh, biodiversity conservation because they said 
uh, protected areas increased about 58% over the last um, um, this uh, millennium development co period. They mentioned a lot about the uh, number and quantity. But in reality, if you go and look at the most of the protected areas, very much on paper, I can say most of them are not very effectively managing. So this is a huge issue about that. So when you talk about the, in the sustainable development goal in the future, the relevance of the forestry sector, one of the points maybe we can consider the more effective indicators is um, I'm quite concerned about the investment. Talking about the investment from the, not only from the government, but also from the um, global development assistant to the forestry sector. There are a lot of high expectation from the forestry sector to the climate change, to the poverty reduction, now again to the green growth economy. But the investment to the forestry sector is comparing to that demand is very low investment. So we need to have a very um, uh, strong, serious you know, investment to this forest sector, especially from the national level government, of course, you know, especially most of the country who rely on the forest sector for their national income. They need to have a very strong national investment program, reinvest in the forestry. This is a very serious thing they need to do. But at the same time, global development assistance now is, uh, I think, reaching about 130 billion. But from out of that, the forestry sector development system is very, very still minimum. So if you really expect to demonstrate the forestry sector can play, we need to be serious about the investment in the forestry sector. This is a, one of the uh, key points uh, I would like to highlight in this event as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, so actually this segues very well perhaps to a question to both Ibu Parma and Paul Yatna. So traditionally forestry conservation and development are um, somewhat segregated, if you wish, in, in terms of a political agenda and also in terms of how you manage a landscape. You may have protected areas and you may have developed um, agricultural sectors that are very with lines clearly drawn. Um, as we talk about now how you integrate forest into development and how you manage these landscapes, what are some of your thoughts? Because this clearly involves not just the public sector, but also very much private sector and also very much local communities. So perhaps I can direct the question to both of you. Yeah. Um, I agree that um, we have to uh, give equitable uh, rights we can say so, to the indigenous people, to the uh, community. And um, from the, the private sector, I think if all the stakeholders uh, play their role, and especially for the private sector, they uh, do things which are necessary with regard to their uh, core of business in uh, working together with other stakeholders to uh, preserve the um, landscape and the environment, I think uh, that would be the ideal situation. Uh, I understand that there's also limitation in the uh, ability of the, the, of the government uh, to play their role. But again, if the private sector in uh, having or conducting their, their uh, business activity at the same time also equally responsible in managing the impact of their business, then uh, it will be uh, something good for um, the uh, sustainable management of the uh, landscape because I think we have to go to the, the basic that actually um, we have as, as a private sector, we have to maximize the positive impact of our 
uh, actions and also minimize the negative impact of our actions. So if everybody really um, understand this and, and play their role, I believe it will be a, a significant contribution to the effort. Yeah, I think that, that's uh, my view from, from private sector. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, we live in one landscape, you know, either private sector, government, or communities. So, one landscape where everybody uh, really uh, looking for to harmonize between really need for development, really need for protection, really need for communities, uh, uh, livelihood, and social. So, if we are thinking about the silos, this is the agriculture, this is uh, forestry, this is uh, uh, cities. I think it's uh, way behind, I mean, inward looking. I mean, if you are forward looking, look at the impact if you are doing something. For example, if you are doing something and outside of this head, headwater, there will be impact to the city, there will be impact to the community, there will be impact to everybody. So I want to see that the landscape level where uh, I think uh, the sustainable landscape is a very important where everybody can play, everybody uh, harmonize all these, not uh, making the, the impact uh, to others. Sometimes because for the sake of development, then we are jeopardizing everybody. Maybe it's a development for uh, short, efficient, but in the long run, maybe they were really discounted. Basically, it's a catastrophe or many other things. So, to me, that if you look at thinking of the landscape level, which is the government usually is so uh, district and 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 contained to very small thing. If you look at Sumatra, for example, uh, you know. 1970, I was flying really uh, from Medan to Jakarta. It's very beautiful, where the landscape, communities, and everything. Now, you you will see it. It's all the almost homogeneous oil palm everywhere. <laughs> I don't see it. So where is the uh, security, food security, and everything. Because once that oil palm or many others uh, community are falling apart of disease or anything, I think there will be a very, very... So the landscape, I mean, I'm a theoretical biologist. I, I always look at that there should be diversities. The landscape has to be diversity. I mean, community has to live with that because there has been thousand years they're living and adapted with the the forest, while you need the development, of course, uh, for, but you cannot say for the sake of the development, you're jeopardizing the landscape. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So now we have, let's open the session to questions from the audience. Do we have some questions? I see a hand that shot up very quickly over there. Um, the gentleman in the back. Um, are there any other questions? One gentleman in the front and a couple over there. So let's take three or four before we... Oh. Please. Yeah, my name is Tony. I'm working with USAID in Jakarta. I mean, when we need to look at the history of community development, community-based forest management, and everything related to community and re their relationship uh, with forestry in this country. I think if you look at the history, the community forestry has been discussed 40 years ago. Since 1978, when people started to talk about community, f <coughs> sorry, community forestry and everything, and you look at the process, political changes and change in approaches to support community. I didn't see too much progress in this country. I didn't see. 
the problem is that the uh, I mean the issues become more and more complex related to the community in, in and their relation to the forest. We have more research, more ideas, more institutions, more regulations. But uh, when I visited many sites, uh, uh, landscapes, uh, conservation, uh, conservation forests, or areas in Sumatra, Kalimantan, and Eastern Indonesia, I see more and more forests degraded. More and more forests are uh, separated from the forest. And I didn't see any good success story that I can tell other people that we can use as a model to tell policymakers about how to to develop better community-based forest management in this country. If you look uh, between two, uh, between early 98 until now, you see the issues people incorporated into discussion or design about uh, community forestry. In the past, we talk about community rights, community responsibilities, and then we talk about sustainable sustainable development. Talk about community forest uh, about uh, sorry about sustainability, gender, governance, and now we talk about climate change. People in the field they get more and more confused. And one of the big gaps that are, one of the big gaps that I see in the field is that the when we talk about the issues, ideas, policies. Who translate those issues and ideas into community-based forest management? Most of the people who work on the ground are local NGOs, or maybe if we have good government extension workers, they can do it. But the big issue now is the, uh, the weak capacity of the local NGOs to translate those issues into action on the ground. We at the USAID, we sometimes get very frustrated that we have you know, we allocate some money to give to NGOs, including the Tropical Forest Conservation Action in Sumatra. We have, we have to, we found so many NGOs, they have brilliant ideas, they good ideas, but they are very weak in, tra in translating ideas into uh, project design, into project management, how to work appropriately with communities. So the issue that, sorry, the issue now, now is, it's not about the ideas, it's not about the concept, it's not about the funding, but the problem is how to get NGOs to translate these ideas into appropriate, good, sound, community-based forest management on the ground. I think if any of you can give us uh, an example how you work with NGOs at the local level, they can do, uh, work with community-based forest management with good success story, with results and impact on rights, responsibility, uh, market or economy, as, uh, uh, and, and governance, it would be interesting for us to learn and how can we apply to uh, our projects in Indonesia. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the question relates to the um, perfect model, perhaps, that and how these things could work. Let's take a couple of other questions. Hi, yes, uh, my name's Emma. I work for a local NGO. Um, <laughs> I definitely agree that communities and indigenous organizations and local community groups should be given rights and should be given uh, control over how they manage their lands and they should definitely be involved in the mapping of that. However, I do think it's important not to romanticize those kind of groups and also talk about them as a homogenous group as well. Um, I was recently in Riau and in an area where uh, you could only access by boat, it's in a protected forest area and I spoke with the head of a local indigenous organization um, and he was quite keen to open up a road, he was also keen on the, the local community opening up um, uh, Kalapa Sawit farms as well, so I think uh, yeah it's quite, I'd be interested to see hear the panel's point of view about um, how you can mitigate that. So once these local communities and indigenous organizations have control of lands, how do we ensure that um, they're actually going to be protecting them? Because not they're human too, right? That indigenous peoples aren't just uh, these wonderful uh, groups of people who definitely want to support um, their local environment and protect it. There are people who can be tempted into um, thinking selfishly and perhaps not thinking about the environment. My name is Fendi Sumarja. I am from PT Reki from the Hutan Harapan in Jambi. The most important things that I feel we discussed in the beginning, in Asia particularly, problems with land tenure is very high. I don't know where the possibility for the ASEAN or Southeast Asia 
countries to find a solution how we can solve the land tenure based on the experiences within each country. Because so far it will come back again to the problem of land tenure, whatever it is in communities development problem. And my, my, my feeling also that the sense of belonging sometimes make it difference between one, uh, one stakeholders to the other stakeholders. And they are talking different thing. Although it is we are talking about the land tenure itself as well as the activities within that community's development. So I would like to find a solution probably from all the panelists to find out a solution on that, those questions. Thank you. Perhaps we'll take a f last question from the lady sitting in the front. Uh, thank you. My name is Adelis Dewati from, uh, I'm in Ibrina Ritor for FIC. Uh, in this discussion, we talk about uh, local community and community first, but suddenly I hear about indigenous people. I will talk about the same people within, I mean, uh, community forest and uh, indigenous people, or is there any distinguished uh, difference between them? Thank you. Okay, so we have four questions. One, um, highlighting the complexity in communities and community forestry and trying to identify some of the success stories and how do you translate complex ideas to local communities and the implementation of those ideas. And the second question relates to um, the point that community forestry groups are certainly not homogeneous. And as we talked about equity, they certainly have a right to development, but you know, what are the trade-offs between development and conservation in their, in their um, land use decisions and their forest de use decisions? Um, then we have one question on land tenure, and perhaps the fourth question is more directed at Joan in the distinction or non-distinction between indigenous peoples and communities. So uh, perhaps Dr. Tint, you want to take the first question? Yes, um, thank you, Chris, and also thank you, Tommy, for your very, very good points. I agree. Uh, most of your point as well, because the, um, as a practitioner to promote this uh, community forestry, uh, sometimes I personally very frustrated about this, uh, the pace of the development of the um, uh, community forest area in the, in the region. Um, even you said, rightly said, we started this concept somewhere around in 1975. You know, um, at that time, the, um, the Jack Westoby, all, all of you know um, from previous uh, FAO uh, Director General, he rightly saying that um, the forest for the local development, right? The forest need to be changed, and we are managing forest is managing the people, the needs of the people. Is uh, that um, since that time we started this uh, community forestry development idea, but it it depends on the. Um, how you built this trust over the last, say, uh, nearly 40 years. You know, trust building takes really time. Most of the time, in most of the land ownership in this region is a public, you know, the government control, government land. There's a, a need to build the trust between the local communities and the government. So sometimes, most of the time, the government trusts the local people. At the same time, local people do not trust the government. So this one, the, the process of this um, approving the community forestry is taking very long in some government, in some country. But there's also the some success story and very rapid movement in the country like Nepal, you know, uh, recognizing the uh, community forest, very um, large scale of the country. And then can see it's a quite a significant amount of the forest uh, under the community managed area. So we, especially the uh, national level decision maker need to be more serious and of course in, the, in their policy even they have a beautiful policy but turning into the practice need to be very practical and that they need to do more and also the very proactive way of understanding and talking to the local people understanding their needs and also the recognizing their rights through the community forestry is still a major gap to, to go and to follow. You also rightly mentioned about the, um, the role of the, um, the, the local NGOs bringing this message to the, uh, to, the, to the local people. 
in the real world we are facing, including the organization like um, uh, regional organization like Recopt, we still trying very hard to you know to survive because the, the as I said, development assistance we can get from the um, this uh, uh, international community is still very limited access, very limited resources, and at the, the most important aspect is even you have a development package, how you use this development package, how you distribute this development package is another question mark for us. Most of the time, these resources are not really reached to the uh, sort of like a local organization or local NGO. They are sustainability and they are also the long-term commitment to you know, they strategically address this kind of the capacity building issues to the local people they need to have a really long-term and strategic support from these um, international development uh, communities. This is the, one of the issues they're still facing. And, but from time to time, the community forestry has been tested already. You know, community forestry is, a, to me, it is a really valid option. Community can, if you apply properly, can address a lot of the issues that we are facing. You know, can address about the livelihood, can address to the poverty reduction, can address to the climate change adaptation, climate change ad mitigation. So you just name it. Now just another uh, uh, global policy comes a green growth economy. If you have a proper arrangement and also the really trust to the local community and local people through the community forest arrangement, I don't you know, I have any doubt about this the success of this model in the long run. The only thing is the investment to this community forest development is very slow comparing to the private sector uh, plantation development. You know, most of the country, they have a more private sector plantation than a more uh, community managed area. So this is the remaining challenge. The recent report from RRI is saying that land tenure reform is uh, talking a lot. Most of them are still in the air. When they were land, it's been turning into the practical action. Up to now, by 2013, according to RRI uh, data, only 500 million are still under the um, 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 community land management, community land tenure. Still far behind the uh, target. We still need to do a lot more to make sure as the gentleman says, sense of belonging. You know, if you don't have any sense of belonging, nobody pays serious attention. This is the remaining challenge for all of us to address further. So this is the most important, how your development assistant really distribute to the, um, the, the target audiences and also the local institution. At the end of the day, the capacity and the commitment of the local institutions will last forever. Some people play very from outside or from externally. They may come and go, depends on the, uh, whether they can grab the, uh, some of the um, uh, development assistance. So the most important thing is that you need to strengthen local institutions from time to time. So that's the way that RECOV is trying very hard to make sure local institution and local uh, people are well um, informed and also, they are also the, um, um, their capacity is uh, well strengthened. So we are trying very hard for that. I know this is a very long way to go, but I personally and professionally, I believe that community forestry is um, one of the very effective solutions if all of us address properly. So thank you very much for that. Yeah. Uh, let me just respond to, uh, for two quick points on the issue of good practice on community forestry. I think um, it's been uh, clear that communities who have land tenure over the forest have managed it better. That's one. And second is that there's a strong community ownership, that it's not actually NGO driven, but it's really the community managing uh, their forest in accordance to the kind of livelihood support that they need. So I think those are, are, are key elements in, the, in successful community forest uh, forestry that I see from the Philippines where I come from. Now on the issue of the indigenous peoples being, uh, yeah, I certainly agree, indigenous peoples are not homogenous and there are already a lot of changes that's happening in indigenous communities in including conflicts within communities where some members have become opportunist or taking advantage uh, over 
the, the community owned uh, resources. So I, I think what's important here is to, to, uh, to again revive the, the values of indigenous peoples with regards to upholding the common good uh, and that resources are to be shared by everyone. So we, we need to, to, be, to, to strengthen the vigilance and, and the, the, the cooperation of, of, of communities along this line so that the use of resources are going to be, uh, be equitable and not subjected to el elite capture, which for example is happening in certain areas of of community forestry where it's not already community owned but it's an, a, a lease arrangement with individuals and thereby those, the, the other owners of the land suddenly becomes the workers of, of, of the community uh, forest management. So the, the, those are the kinds of, of, of challenges that, uh, that, is, that exist. In terms of the issue of land tenure in ASEAN, uh, that's certainly a, a very big challenge. Uh, and if, if we look at how land tenure in the ASEAN is now, in the context of indigenous peoples, the Philippines have a strong law on indigenous peoples' rights, which also recognized uh, our right to our, our land. Uh, Cambodia has a, has a law on community land rights, uh, and now we have the constitutional court decision for the recognition of the forest customary rights of, of Indonesia. Uh, the problem more is the, the enforcement of these laws. And that's where the biggest challenge that we face in, in quite a number of, of ASEAN. So we need the support of other sectors and, other, and, 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 and the, especially the state agencies to really also recognize the, the contribution of, of land tenure for indigenous peoples and local communities in terms of ensuring better uh, sustainable resource management. There's already clear evidence that, that land tenure, uh, areas where land tenure are recognized are, or are the areas where resources are better managed by, by the communities and that benefits are better shared as well by the com communities. Uh, in terms of the, the issue of indigenous peoples and local communities, are, are, are these the same? Uh, not in the context of, uh, of ASEAN. Uh, I, I recognize that indigenous peoples is a contentious issue in the region, but if we, if we look at international human rights instruments, it did not define what indigenous peoples are, but it clearly provides for certain collective rights to correct social injustice that has been uh, done for centuries of discrimination of people who are the original owners of land but were discriminated and but still maintains our cultural identity, our cultural heritage, our strong relationship with our lands, and we identify ourselves as, as indigenous. So those are the kind, those are the features that makes us different from the majority of the population of a certain country and where we persist and insist our cultural difference and the way we relate and uh, 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 we relate uh, with, with nature in a, in a very holistic manner. So that's just a quick response to that question. Thank you. Can I add to the question? Uh, answer to the question number one. Uh, well, I share your frustration, and uh, it's also our experience that it's not that easy to find uh, the most suitable uh, local NGO to be uh, partnering with. But we have a success story in Sukabumi, West Java, where we work with a local NGO. <coughs> um, I'm afraid I cannot mention the name, otherwise it will be a promotion. <laughs> of the local NGO, uh, but uh, sorry. So, so uh, it is to us very important that we don't start big. I think the key is to start small, and then if it succeeds, then you can replicate to other uh, locations and start bigger, perhaps. But of course, the question is whether this can cope with the uh, rate of the conversion of forest into something else in an unsustainable way. But only conservation uh, uh, skills training, but also organizational uh, training. So this 
uh, Lali is currently is very independent and they can uh, have a highly negotiation uh, skill and and talk with the government and also to invite other uh, stakeholders. And now they are independent and they can run their program on their own. Uh, another key is for the community, uh, sorry, for the program to be uh, successful is for the community itself to have the uh, ownership and sense of belonging and the willingness to work together with other stakeholders. And um, also to uh, for them to be able to earn their income from this, uh, from the program, whatever project or program that, that you have. Uh, at the same time, when they are also preserving the nature, because it's just impossible for us to ask them to play their role in preserving the nature if their income is disturbed. So at the same time, you have to give them the um, economic uh, add value uh, when you also ask them to participate in uh, preserving the uh, environment. Uh, <clears throat> I, I really like to respond to now pa Tony about this uh, frustrating about local NGOs but I, I feel that I'm really happy this now, this time because there's so many Basically, uh, local NGO now uh, uh, participate in the community forestry. I think compared to 40 years ago, of course, the the number at the time was very low. But now it's you know a lot of people you know. But the only thing that I I don't see it that how this all this everywhere in Indonesia, for example. We can learn from one each other, you know, I mean, we can bring it to the high levels, quality of this uh, community and local NGO, especially when they're translating to the community. I understand that there is so many issues like climate change, ecosystem services, all the jargon, you know, how that really translated to the very simple language to the communities. That is really need the basic uh, training for not the community but the local NGO who's you know working with the community. I I do believe that capacity building, strengthening this uh, knowledge enforcement on some point by community and together with the government is uh, necessary. But look at what that really. The uh, comparing, for example, the deforestation in the national park compared to the area where the community, right? I think it's way. The lot of deforestation in Indonesia basically now is in the national park and protected area compared to the area where the communities uh, belonging. So it seems to me, uh, if you are comparing this, it's, it's, it's uh, not real. But the other thing is also uh, to me that of course, uh, local community control the land, for example, the case of the Riau. I think uh, for many, many years in Riau, the community is, uh, you know, they, they live and they never use the, the land for many different things. They just uh, for basic livelihood. But when the oil palm come with all this uh, coming migration from North Sumatra and many others, it's becoming jealousy, it's becoming, you know, it's, it's many things there. So they're starting the, uh, the even the selling uh, the land belong to the uh, communities. So it is really uh, not really a pure of this uh, right or uh, channel, but it's really outside who come and, and start to, to influence the communities. And uh, the problem of land tenure, I mean, Indonesia, you look at that right now, the revolution, I, I don't see the evolution of this thing, but the revolution with a lot of new things in Indonesia, like, for example, the decree of the Constitutional Court that now is uh, number 35, I believe, that really making that community get the gain again for uh, right uh, to be uh, hutan adat, which is adat, adat forest. So 
And then the other one is also the Minister of Forestry. There are so many now um, uh, giving a lot of opportunity for community. I believe there are already more than 1,000 uh, uh, village forests now is recognized by Ministry of Forestry as as uh, belong to the uh, adult leaders, adult community. So, there's so many revolution. I mean, in Indonesia, uh, in terms of the recognition, recognizing about the community. But of course, there is no one silver bullet to resolve all these things. It's uh, so complex, especially when you know uh, nobody uh, trying to work in the landscape level collaborating how to resolve this uh, harmonizing between the needs. Because if you look at that Indonesia, for example, in Indonesia, the law on the uh, land, uh, land use planning, they changes every five years and they can change who is going to defend that land use uh, planning for province, for district. So. Uh, it is really hard for community to be involved all the time. So I think uh, once you have already uh, becoming law, this is the law where the harmonizing between the need for conservation, the need for uh, community livelihood, the need for development like oil palm and many others, then, you know, it can settle. Uh, but otherwise, that was really difficult because uh, without uh, collaborating, understanding each other. I don't believe don't use the, the brain, but use the heart. Otherwise, we always have uh, uh, using that logic. Everything has to be logic. But if you're using the heart, that you can use everybody uh, to be uh, shared between all the things in the landscape level. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Poyana. I think um, I'm under pressure to finish on time. So we have just about three minutes left. <laughs> so I would ask perhaps each of the key speakers to, in 30 minutes, what is your one key message that you would like to bring out again from this session that we could bring up to as part of the key messages for the conference? And since we started with Dr. Tin this time, perhaps we start with Pak Yatna with this way. And you have 30 seconds. Well, I, I want to see the more incentive uh, uh, measure, or incentive of community to conserve or to work with the, the forest management. It's not only a blaming, because the blaming is so easy. But how do we develop the con uh, incentive community? It's billion, million dollars. All is talking about the policy, not talking with the communities. I mean, there are a lot of success stories in community, but we always forget. Thank you. Ibu Parma? Yeah, I shared the same view with uh, Dr. Yatna. Um, and I also would like to um, highlight in here the importance of the uh, multi-stakeholder uh, approach where everybody played their role. Uh, not only just the community, the private sector, also the public sector, and um, most important as well is the government. Thank you. June. I have three points to recommendations. <laughs> One is that uh, there needs to be a, a, a research on the traditional livelihoods, including sustainable shifting cultivation from the perspective of a landscape approach uh, for st sustainable resource management. Second is that there should be policy harmonization in favor of recognizing the forest customary rights of indigenous peoples and, and local uh, communities. And third, my key message is that equitable development and green economy will only be successful if there, if there is a recognition of the rights and entitlements of indigenous peoples, local communities, and a respect for ecological balance and ensuring the full full participation in sustainable management of resources by indigenous peoples and local communities, as, a, uh, as well as other uh, rights holders. Thank you. Okay, Chris, I would like to highlight the, the role of the research institution like C4, and also the um, 
the application of the research results by the policy maker and decision maker. And most of the time, um, policy making and decision making are very much based on the popular narratives. Mm. So these people need to be well informed and also the, uh, the research, C4 did a number of the good research over the last 20 years. So these research re results need to be um, um, uh, disseminated effectively through the partnership. These research need to be reached to the, to even the target to the local audiences. So this is the most important aspect. Even you do have the research result, is to need to really disseminate it effectively to reach to the policy maker, decision maker, as well as the local community as well. This is thank you. Well, thank you to the four speakers for very succinctly actually doing my job and summarizing already the key messages. So uh, thank you very much for that. And thank you very much to the audience for being very patient and uh, sitting through this discussion session. I think we have quite a lot of uh, very exciting points that were brought up, issues around tenure, issues around equity, issues around what are appropriate incentives, dialogue, and also the need for research. Uh, so please join me in thanking our panel.